Today we're talking about causation, we're talking about causality, we're talking about cause and effect. You've all heard the phrase, correlation doesn't mean causation, right? We want to understand the nature of the relationship between exposures and outcome. Okay, stick with me, you're going to love this. Now, typically in public health, when we talk about causation, we talk about Bradford Hill criteria. I'm going to go through these very briefly with you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because I don't like them. And I'm going to explain to you exactly why it is that I don't like them in just a minute. So we'll go through them. Strength of association. There's a strong correlation between the exposure of interest and the outcome of interest. Consistency of finding. If we repeated the study again and again and again, we would observe the same correlation. Temporal sequence. The cause precedes the effect. The exposure precedes the outcome. It makes sense. Dose response and reversibility are really two sides of the same coin, right? Dose response is if you add more of the exposure, you'll see more of the outcome. And reversibility is if you take away the exposure, the effect is reversed. Specificity is really this exposure is related specifically with this outcome and by contrast to it's related to just about everything and one of that everything just happens to be the outcome of interest and plausibility this relationship is in fact possible. Now on the surface these criteria seem to make sense right you would think that if you met these criteria naturally you would be making a strong argument that this particular exposure is causally related to the outcome of interest and I'd like to argue that that is not true. And here's why. Look, our starting point, right, is that we've seen something in the data. We've seen a signal in the data that there is a relationship, that there is a correlation between an exposure and an outcome. The question we're trying to answer is, is the nature of that relationship causal, right? If you look at five of these six criteria or seven criteria, if you break dose response and reversibility up, if you look at these criteria, all of them accept plausibility. All of them are basically restating the correlation, all of them are just re-describing the signal that we've already seen in the data. They're not giving you an idea or they're not giving you any evidence about the nature of that relationship. And plausibility is only useful when the counterfactual seems to be the case. In other words, when a relationship is completely implausible and we can say, look, there's clearly not a causal relationship here. For example, the crowing of the cock in the morning does not cause the sun to rise. It's not plausible, so we can rule out that causal relationship. So plausibility is basically just saying this relationship is possible in some sense. It's not really a strong indicator that this is necessarily causal. And the biggest weakness in the Bradford Hill criteria is that it doesn't take into account the fact that all of these can really be explained by alternatives, things like chance, bias, confounding, reverse causation, and fraud. And so the right way to think about causality or cause and effect or understanding the causal relationship between exposure and outcome is by saying, let's exclude chance, let's exclude bias, let's exclude confounding, let's exclude reverse causation, and let's exclude fraud. And then we can draw a conclusion that the relationship between these two variables is in fact causative provided, of course, that it's plausible. So let's go through these quickly, right? And the idea is that if you can exclude these other possible explanations, you can conclude that the relationship is likely due to causation, or at least you've strengthened that argument. Okay, you got it? So let's go through them one at a time very briefly. Just a quick thank you to the University of Limerick. This video was created with support from the University of Limerick. They've got a master's degree in public health, which is absolutely outstanding. I know this for a fact because I know the people that designed the course. I know the people that are running the course. They're absolutely world class. The course, you can do the course part-time or full-time. And what is really impressive about the University of Limerick's program is that it has been designed specifically to prepare you for the workplace. Graduates from UL or U the University of Limerick are, are popping out ready and willing to do productive work in the public health space in a way that is absolutely amazing. So I'm, I'm impressed with them. I highly recommend the program. There's a link in the description below. You can click on that and find out more. The first is chance. The idea here is that basically we've sampled a, a, a population to do a study, to draw a conclusion, and by absolute chance, we happen to have sampled the population in a way that by chance we've seen a relationship that doesn't really exist and that can happen. Bias, you're basically faced with the same problem except that in your study design you have systematically basically selected a population 
that incorrectly demonstrates an incorrect, a fake or false relationship, either in, in terms of the way that you've selected your sample or in the way that you've measured the data that you're getting from the sample, your measurement instrument might be wrong. There's a number of reasons why you might find bias. I'm not going to get into that in this video, but essentially there's a problem with your study. Okay, confounding, uh, people often call confounding an example of bias. It's not really, it's a slightly different thing. With respect to confounding, really what we've got is we've got a relationship between A and B. It might seem causative, but in actual fact, both A and B are associated with C. C is not on the causal pathway between A and B, and in actual fact, what seems to be A causing B is an actual fact relationship between A and B and C and B. Let me give you a quick example to illustrate that. Uh, the incidence of shark attacks goes up at the same time as the consumption of ice cream, right? Ice cream consumption doesn't cause uh, shark attacks, but both of those variables, ice cream consumption and shark attacks, are associated with nice hot summer days, right? People swim in the sea when it's hot, more chance of getting bitten by a shark. Uh, on a hot day, you're more likely to eat ice cream. Ice cream eating doesn't cause heart attacks. They're both associated with a third variable, which is not on the causal pathway. That's confounding, okay? Reverse causation, we may be assuming that A, because we see a relationship between A and B, we assume that A causes B, but in actual fact, the relationship is in the other direction. B is causing A. Fraud, we don't have to explain what that means. Uh, there's a lot of fraud in the scientific world, uh, and somebody fictitiously kind of fabricates a relationship and publishes it in the, in the literature. If you exclude all of this, then you're in a position to say, we now think given that it's plausible, given that we try to identify a mechanism where we can, we can't always, that we think the relationship is in fact causal. As always, thank you very much for watching this video. Stay and watch another video. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Click on the bell notification if you want notification of future videos. And you can join this channel as a member. Members get access to special videos that are all about jobs in the public health space. Uh, have a great day. Don't ever change, don't do drugs. I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.